Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, firstly, thanks to Daniel for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers, even though they're not here, for giving me this opportunity to speak. So my name's Neil, I'm a postdoc here at NUS and what I'm gonna be discussing today in my presentation is really a collection of a number of pieces of work that I've been working over the years and throughout my PhD, which is really based on the idea of the Ensemble Kalman filter. So the Ensemble Kalman filter is a very simplistic but applicable algorithm which has been used in a number of different fields. And what I'm interested in this presentation is really to apply it and use it in two other fields which have been of quite of interest recently. And these two fields include inverse problems, specifically Bayesian inverse problems, where we can see some relationships between these two fields. But also more interestingly, there's been a lot of attention in applying optimal transport techniques to data simulation and inverse problems. So really I'm trying to make this presentation uh, not so technical, but really to make sure that you can bridge links between these different fields, okay? And uh, because this work has been over a number of years, I've been quite fortunate to work with a number of individuals on this who are all listed on the board right here. So Marco, Lassie, Claudia, Andrew, Alex, and Simon. But before I get into the presentation, let me just give you a very brief outline of what the talk will actually consist of today. So at the very beginning, I think it's always very good to discuss some sort of motivation towards my presentation. And what I mean by this is really discuss in a very basic form the EMKF, how it works, and how the algorithm is itself. Okay, so there's a lot of theory that you can give on the EMKF. I'm just gonna really give you its main benefits, its main disadvantages, as well as giving you the algorithm in probably the most simplistic form that you can think of. Okay, and then once I move from the ENKF, I'm then gonna discuss the main application which I've been considering, which is the ENKF towards inverse problems. And this will actually be the main bulk and section of the whole presentation itself. I'm gonna begin with a review of inverse problems, both inver most likely both deterministic and Bayesian inverse problems, and then move on to the application of discussing the ENKF to inverse problems, which was proposed 10 years ago. And in this bit right here, I'm gonna discuss two main projects that I've been working on. One, which is to develop hierarchical approaches for ENKF techniques towards inverse problems, and as well as this, to discuss more optimization methods for ENKF, such as projection-based optimization, but also box-constrained optimization as well. So as I mentioned, this will be the main bulk of the presentation, and then if time permits, I will discuss some of the other key uh, ideas that we've been working on recently, which is to discuss the relationship between optimal transport and ENKF for inverse problems as well. And then finally, at the very end, I'll give a review of what I've been doing and just give some uh, indication of further interests in work that we can consider for this as well. So my work has been really been at the interface between mathematical statistics and applied mathematics. Uh, and really, there's a lot of common questions that you can ask in these two fields, but arguably one of the most important questions, maybe not the most important, but one of the most important questions that you can ask in these two fields is how can we actually blend under underlying dynamics, which you can consider as a model, with actually noisy observations with data? So this is a question which has been considered for a very long time in very different ways, and up until this very point, it's still a very important and fundamental question which people ask. And to the best of my knowledge and understanding, probably the first systematic way that this was done, in a methodical way written in a paper, dates back to the original ideas given by Rudolf Kalman back in 1960. So what did Rudolf Kalman exactly do? Well, as I mentioned in the previous slide, he was one of the first people, if not the first systematic way, to come up with an idea to relate both the dynamics model and the data model. So these two equations are given on the board right here, as you can see at the very top. And what Kalman decided to do was to link these, through, uh, link these two equations right here in a probabilistic manner, okay? So the general idea is that you would have some initial dynamics, which eventually turns into a signal given by V of zero. You would assume it's of a Gaussian form, and then through the moments of this Gaussian form, which are the mean and the covariance, you would update this in your update equation. Now, the interesting thing that we see from the Kalman filter right here is that you can write it in this probabilistic way, where you do assume that your initial dynamics is governed by a Gaussian uh, distribution itself, and you have a number of further assumptions where you assume that your initial dynamics is independent of both the noise of the dynamics model, but also the data model as well. So this idea came about in 1960 where he posed it in the journal of basic engineer and I don't know how basic it was but uh, I haven't actually seen the journal or the paper itself. But uh, you can really give an, it really gives you an indication of how powerful and applicable this is given it's already got 27,000 citations. So very powerful, very applicable indeed. And as I mentioned, just highlighted through the other bullet points on this slide is that the key idea is that you're updating the mean and the covariances of your initial ensemble to get an update of the actual signal itself. Okay. 
So this is just one way that you can consider the Kalman filter. What I mean by that is a probabilistic structure. The other way that you can consider is actually to consider an optimization, or as I've mentioned up in the board, a sequential optimization framework, where instead of characterizing your solution as a probabilistic distribution of the signal, V of n, conditioned on Y of n, what you can do instead is that you can come up with um, a quadratic functional, which is given by J of n, and then usually in the way of optimization or even through deterministic inverse problems, your actual solution corresponds to just a minimizer of this functional right here, which is given as the mean right here. So two different ways that you can consider the Kalman filter, but the main thing that I want to, for, for you really to take away from the Kalman filter is this one limitation which really led to a number of other variants of the Kalman filter, which is the computational cost that you, that you have. So if you assume that D on the board is the dimension of your state space, then the order of complexity in terms of the computational cost you have for the ensemble Kalman filter is of order D squared. And usually in a number of applications, you would assume that D is a very large number. So of course, if you consider this to be D squared, it's just really infeasible for a lot of real world applications itself. Okay, and just mention again that D is the space space dimension. And as a result of this, there's been a lot of different forms and variants of the Kalman filter which have been made and developed. I'm not going to cover most of them or pretty much all of them, but what I am going to say is that the particular one that I'm interested in, which is a variant of the Kalman filter, is the ensemble Kalman filter. And just heuristically, what I mean by the ensemble Kalman filter is that it really works in a very similar way to the Kalman filter, which is given in these two equations right here. But the key difference is that you can think of it as being a Monte Carlo approximation of the Kalman filter, where you have some initial ensemble of particles that you want to update through its mean and covariance. But instead, all you do is that you take a random sample of this, and through very similar dynamics, you just propagate it in the exact same way as the Kalman filter. So as before, you have the exact same equations where you've got the equations for the signal and the data as well. And you assume that you have this probabilistic structure which, uh, which says that you've got a Gaussian initial ensemble. And of course, you've got these independent conditions which you have right here. And this method was proposed by Evanson in 1994 who is shown right here on the left-hand side. And he's written a very informative book on the ensemble Kalman filter which I would recommend if anyone's interested in learning about this. And just like the original Kalman filter, this has been extremely applicable as well due to the fact that it is more computationally feasible for a lot of high-scale dimensions problems as well. And just to give an idea of this, it was initially used and motivated for certain applications such as numerical weather predictions and also applications in geophysical sciences as well. And the idea of course is that you have right here an ensemble of particles which is given by U of K of N, where K is the number of ensemble particles that you have and N is the iteration. And then through the iterative procedure that you see right here, you're actually interested in this map in between that ensemble of particles to its update. Okay. And of course, as well as this, you can not only just consider a probabilistic way of looking at this, you can think of an optimization way of thinking of this, where the equations are pretty much almost identical, a little bit different, and of course, you're interested in characterizing the mean just through the minimization of this particular functional right here. But as I mentioned, the difference is that the computational cost is significantly less, and what you would usually assume is that with your ensemble of particles, you would have some dimension to that, which we're going to label as k, and the complexity which you have for the ensemble Kalman filter is of order kd. And for a lot of applications as well, it's very common to assume that capital K, which is the dimension of your ensemble of particles, is significantly smaller than the state space, the dimension of the state space. And based on this, this of course is already an improvement compared to the order of D squared that you did, did get with the Kalman filter as well. So really, the ENKF is a Monte Carlo approximation of the Kalman filter, and it reduces the computational cost quite significantly. The other variants, which I didn't mention, which include the likes of the extended Kalman filter and 3D VAR, really come in between these two methods, okay, where the computational cost isn't as good as the ensemble Kalman filter, but the ideas between these other variants is that they try to move away from the assumptions of the Kalman filter. So one thing I didn't mention is that with the Kalman filter, you usually assume that the dynamics is linear. So what these other variants try to do between the Kalman filter and the ENKF is try to move away from this where they assume that the dynamics are actually nonlinear. Okay, so I just wanted to point out that there are different variants between these two, which came about between these two methods, which I'm not going to go over in this presentation. So what I've been interested throughout my PhD is really in inverse problems, and to be more specific, statistical inverse problems. So rather than giving you all gory details of inverse problems, I felt, I felt given that inverse problems have been discussed quite a bit in this conference, just to really discuss it in one slide. Okay, just a very concise slide. And traditionally, if you looked at uh, inverse problems and trying to find a definition in any textbook, it would always give you a very horrible definition, such as I think the first original textbook that gave a definition of an inverse problem was one of Keller's Applied Mathematics books, and it was so complicated, so difficult, that probably the 
universal way that you can write a definition of an inverse problem is just given by this aim right here, where what you're interested in is the recovery of some input or unknown u. Let's say it's, um, it lies in some particular space. We can assume here that it lies in some Hilbert space. And you're interested in the recovery of u from x given noisy measurements of the data given by y, where y can just be written in this particular form right here, y equals calligraphic g of u plus eta. There's a number of things in this formula which make it interesting. Of course, you've got your data y and you've got your u which are connected. And the two things that I haven't discussed is that usually you assume that you've got some noise. Here we've got additive noise which of course makes the data actually noisy. But you've got this calligraphic g which is really a map between the space of parameters which you're interested in, which is x, to the space of observations which are given by y. Okay, so this is just the forward operator between these two spaces, x and y, which I've labeled above. Uh, and for a number of years, the most basic approach that was taken for inverse problems was referred to as the classical or deterministic approach, where a similar to the Kalman filter, you characterize a functional, and just the solution of your inverse problem is just the minimizer of this functional. But recently, in the last 10 years or so, there has been a lot of uh, extensions uh, and ideas looking at an alternative approach, which is really a statistical or Bayesian approach. And what this approach is interested in is that if you look at uh, equation one and you see a number of quantities of interest, then what it's interested in is taking these quantities of interest or quantities, treating them as random variables, and then through Bayes' theorem, you can put a probabilistic distribution of the random variable u given y, which is known as the posterior, done through Bayes' rule. So this, in, in essence, in the finite dimensional case, is just a very basic formulation of Bayes' Bayesian inverse problems in the finite dimensional case. Now, why I mentioned that Bayesian inverse problems got a lot of uh, excitement and a lot of interest in the last 10 years or so was because really of the extension from the finite dimensional case to the infinite dimensional case. And if you consider this translation, what that means is that instead of being interested in a distribution of the random variable u given y, what you're now interested in instead is a measure. Uh, measure. And really, the connection between the two measures, which is the posterior measure given by mu of y and the prior measure given by mu of zero, is just given through this radon Nicodem derivative. And this is equal to 1 over z, where this is your normalizing constant. And as well as this, you've got this exponential form of some misfit functional, where the misfit functional is just given as the very last equation on the slide right here. Now, if you look at this particular form of the actual radon Nicodem derivative, you can see that this looks very common and, and it has a very similar um, structure to many things shown in probability. So really, you can interpret this if you're from a statistical physics background as sort of the Gibbs measure or the Gibbs distribution given right here. Okay, so two approaches that you can consider for inverse problems. What I've been interested in and what I've been looking at in this presentation is really the statistical approach to inverse problems. So with inverse problems and with ENKF, of course, the next natural thing to do is really to combine, the, combine those ideas. And that's what I've been looking at throughout my PhD, where I'm interested in applying ensemble Kalman filtering techniques to solve inverse problems. And if one was interested in doing this, you would have the exact same problem statement as you did on the previous slide, where you're interested in recover, recovering some quantity of interest you from noisy measurements given by Y itself. So as I said, this was looked at 10 years ago, first applied, and this was given in a very basic form given by a number of co-authors such as Dean Oliver, Albert Reynolds, another co-author who I forget who produced it in 2008. And they were interested in very similar applications to Evanson was in numerical weapon predictions. But since then, what has been done is an extension in a 2013 paper, which has really applied the idea of ensemble Kalman inversion, which is what I'm going to refer to as the ENKF2 inverse problems, to PDE constrained inverse problems. There's a lot of inverse problems which are of interest, which lies throughout partial differential equations, which is something that the original co-authors didn't, uh, didn't really take into consideration. So what they did in the 2013 paper by Marco Iglesias, Cody, and Andrew was to really formulate this in terms of PDE-constrained inverse problems. And what they were interested in was a noise-controlled system, which uh, I, I forgot to put after the IE. But the idea was that it is if you, take, if you take the noise in your Bayesian inverse problem to zero, then your ensemble of particles would tend towards the truth. That was the general idea between, behind the noise-controlled system. And the very nice thing about this method is that really it's very simplistic, but you can think of this as being a black box. And what I mean by this is that no derivative information is required whatsoever, okay, within this particular method. So regardless of what partial differential equation you have, you really don't need to compute derivatives. You don't really need to have a lot of information about the partial differential equations. All you need is the particular method that you have right here. And instead of the derivatives, what you're using is the covariances from the Kalman filter, which I'll discuss in the next slide right here. But very similarly to the ENKF, just like ensemble Kalman inversion, there's a very limited theoretical understanding about both these approaches right here. And still to this day, there, there, there's still a lack of understanding where a lot of work can be done based on this. Now, there's a very important lemma regarding this actual uh, approach to inverse problems, which I'm not going to discuss yet, but I'll just discuss 
at the end of the next slide. So just to give you a very basic algorithm of how it works, it's very similar to the ENKF where you have a number of procedures that you're interested in. So the very basic first procedure that you have in this algorithm is to design the initial ensemble. How would you actually design your initial ensemble of particles? And this is just really based on choosing your prior distribution and just base it on this prior distribution. So take whatever your favorite distribution is. Let's say we've got a Gaussian distribution. You can just base it on a Gaussian distribution where, which, it, which represents your initial ensemble of particles. And then through the two main steps that you have of the ENKF, which is the prediction step, which defines the sample mean and covariances. And then finally, once you've done this, where you've defined the sample mean and covariances, you use them and come up with the update step where you make the update of your ensemble of particles using these actual moments itself. Where the very first bit, um, if this is how you do it. This first bit, if any of you are familiar with Kalman filtering theory, can just be uh, characterized as the Kalman gain. And this, of course, is just the model discrepancy that you have or the innovation you have within the Kalman filter. So this is a discrepancy between your ensemble of particles evaluated in the forward evaluation, um, subtracted, of course, from your noisy measurements. And these are just using the actual covariances as weights to actually update your ensemble, which is given as this right here. But there is a, f a number of limitations, of course, with this method. One of the limitations, as I've mentioned, is that there is a real clear lack of theoretical understanding. And what I mean by that is particular convergence results, but as well as this coming up with error estimators with the ENKF, uh, with, with ensemble Kalman inversion. This is very similar to the ENKF, where there is a great deal of lack of understanding uh, in terms of error estimators. But of course, recently, there has been some very interesting work which has looked at this. But what I, what I, what I really want you to, to consider for this presentation is this main limitation, which really states that if you have an initial ensemble, and if you update your ensemble of particles, then the updated ensemble of particles is always spanned by the li linear initial ensemble, uh, linear span of the initial ensemble. So heuristically, what this means is that if you've got a particular form of your initial ensemble, let's say it's a Gaussian random field, then if you put this initial ensemble into your actual method as well, uh, it's going to have a limitation in that the output is going to have almost a very similar structure to it. So it makes it very difficult to actually learn from um, the truth itself if your initial ensemble is very different. So this is a disadvantage for the reason I gave, in that if your initial ensemble of particles is very different to your truth, but it's also an advantage because if you know that your truth is very similar to how you choose your prior, it can be very worthwhile to look at this. Okay? So in some ways, this is an advantage, but in most ways, you could really consider this a, for, a disadvantage. Okay? And this is usually known in the literature as the subspace property. So one of the things that I've been interested in throughout my PhD in ensemble Kalman inversion is really to move away from this limitation. It's a big limitation. If you've got a particular structure, you can't really learn anything. So of course, one obvious way to nullify this and move on from this is to consider a hierarchical approach where we're interested in hyperparameters that actually define this covariant structure. So a very common assumption is to assume that your prior is of a Gaussian form. Why would you assume that? Well, for a lot of the theory, it makes it very easy because you can derive a lot of theoretical results. But also, it's a very applicable Gaussian. It's a, it's a very applicable prior because uh, a lot of real-world phenomena where you're interested in parameters of interest can be modeled quite nicely using Gaussian random fields. So, one particular covariance, uh, particular covariance family that I'm interested in, which has been mentioned numerous times, just like the previous talk, is the whittle matern covariance family right here. And this covariance family is just given right here, which is the covariance function. So there's a number of interesting things that you can see. First is this gamma function, but also right here you've got a modified bezel function of the second kind. But what I really want to point you towards in this actual covariance function are the hyperparameters that define it. Namely, you've got an amplitude factor, or you can think of a scaling factor. You've also got the length scale as well, which is given by tau, sorry, the inverse length scale. And you've also got some regularity or smoothness of the actual whittle matern covariance function as well. And when we consider hierarchical ensemble Kalman inversion, what this means is that we're not only interested in the random field which is generated through this covariance function, we're also interested in reconstructing a lot of these different hyperparameters which define it as well. So the idea is, is that if you can actually reconstruct these hyperparameters here, then hopefully you can get an overall better reconstruction because these parameters define the underlying unknown itself. Now, there's many ways that you can actually generalize Gaussian random fields. You can do this through covariance functions. Another way that you can do this is to generalize this through covariance operators. And a natural way to go from this covariance function to this covariance operator is just to use the autocorrelation of this particular function right here. It's a little bit technical. I haven't put it in this slide for those reasons. But if anyone's interested in understanding the relationship of how to get from this top equation to this, I'd be more than happy to discuss, them, uh, to discuss it with them afterwards as well. 
And just to point out from this slide that, of course, we are interested in hierarchical Bayesian inverse problems, which means we're interested in this application to understand the amplitude skill and, or the skill and factor, the regularity, but as well as this, the inverse length skill as well. Okay. So there's numerous ways of simulating from this Gaussian random field. Probably the most obvious way is just to simulate it through a carhuna luvi expansion, which I haven't done right here. In other words, a spectral expansion. But what I'm interested in is actually to do an, an alternative approach to actually simulate from this Gaussian random field. And this way of um, simulating a Gaussian random field is through this stochastic partial differential equation right here. So this idea goes back to the paper of Rue and Lindgren in 2011 or 2012. And the very nice idea which they had is that one way to actually simulate from a Gaussian random field or to simulate, from a, to simulate a Gaussian random field is that if you solve this stochastic partial differential equation, which looks very similar to the covariance operator that I gave you on the previous slide, if you solve this stochastic partial differential equation using whatever finite difference or finite element method that you have, then your unknown which you're solving for, which is V in this case, has the exact covariance structure given through this Whittle-Matern prior, Whittle-Matern covariance function right here. And this significantly reduces the cost compared to the Cahun luvi expansion uh, compared to this, which is significantly uh, cheaper. And as a result, this is a very favorable way of actually simulating Gaussian random fields in, this, in the field of spatial statistics, okay? Using this stochastic partial differential equation to simulate V, which is a Gaussian random field as well. Now, we're interested in hierarchical approaches towards inverse problems. And the motivation that we took was to understand hierarchical approaches um, from computational statistics. So there's a number of papers which have looked at hierarchical computational statistics in the case of Gaussian process priors. And these ideas go back to the ideas of Roberts, Skuld, and Omiris uh, Papaspiliopoulos from their 06 and 07 papers right here. And what they considered in terms of hierarchical approaches for Gaussian process priors is really to consider two types of approaches. The first approach that you can do is think of a centered approach where you're interested in reconstructing the unknown V, but also theta, which is just a collection of hyperparameters as well. And the other approach which they considered, they refer to as the non-centered approach, where what they're interested in is psi and theta. Now, if you look at the stochastic partial differential equation right here, I said that if you solve this, you're interested in the random field given by V. But, all, but if you actually reparameterize your solution in terms of V, which is given by psi, then you can just write the solution of the stochastic partial differential equation given by psi. And what this means is that if you actually write your prior forms um, in your actually inverse problem, if you have your prior, which is just given by this, then just using conditional probability that you have, this is just equal to, of course, V conditioned on theta multiplied by theta as well. And this is for the centered case. And if you consider the non-centered case, the change in this means that these two quantities right here are actually independent itself, which means that you don't have this dependence on theta if you're trying to actually generate V. Instead, what you do get instead is the probability of psi multiplied by the probability of theta right here. And why this is particularly interested in this case is that if you actually remove the dependence between the unknown and its hyperparameters, as you've done in this case, then the motivation behind this presentation is that maybe you can actually break away from this limited subspace property because you remove this dependence um, that you have through the non-centered approach. So our initial understanding and belief is that if you use this non-centered approach compared to the centered approach, you would actually get better reconstructions and you could actually effectively learn these hyperparameters within your inversion. And I'm going to showcase this through a number of simple experiments. So I've been interested in PDE, constraint Bayesian inverse problems. This slide was given in the very first talk, but uh, I'm not going to familiarize yourself. I'm not going to familiarize you with the actual PDE itself, but this is just one common PDE which is very much used in inverse problems, known as electrical impotence tomography. And what it's really interested in is the conductivity distribution, which is given by kappa, from measurements of the voltages which are given by mu. Okay, new. And the motivation just quickly behind this actual inverse problem is that it's interested in detecting the differences between the conductivity distributions given in this domain right here. So just as an example, you've got two blobs in the middle right here. These are actually one fixed particular conductivity level, but also in the domain as well, not including these two blobs, you've got a different level of conductivity. Okay, so the motivation in medical imaging is that if you have differences between conductivity, hopefully these can correspond to actually um, assessing the likelihood of particular diseases, okay? So that's the idea that different levels of conductivity can correspond to finding the chances of 
assess an, whether a disease is likely or not. I'm not too much of an expert on that, but that's what they tell me, okay? And just the inverse problem, of course, is just interested in using noisy measurements of your forward solution given by new to solve kappa, which is the conductivity distribution. So very simply, I'm going to assume that we have a truth of this, okay? So a good question is how do we actually come up with this truth right here, okay? So the truth, of course, uh, doesn't very much look like a Gaussian random field, but what we've done for this truth, which is very important, is that we've simulated a Gaussian random field through a number of set hyper, through a, a number of hyperparameters, and what we've done is just simply um, done a level set, um, a level set threshold and base on this Gaussian random field. So usually what I mean by that is that if you have your random field which is given by, let's say, m u, then what a level set threshold and would be interested in is that it would consider all of the values where u is, let's say, greater than zero, and it would label it as u, and then you would also consider the case where u is less than zero itself. So this is just one basic level set formulation that you can do in order to make this sort of a piecewise constant uh, truth. So we simulated a Gaussian random field. We've done a level set reconstruction. But why this is very important in this context is that unlike this level set formulation right here, it doesn't really take, take into consideration any of the hyperparameters in the threshold in that you see. But if you look quite clearly, this cannot be done through this threshold in right here, where you're not going to get these two blobs exactly corresponding to positive values and negative values. So the way that we've actually done this threshold in is through a Bayesian level set threshold in, where it does take into consideration the hyperparameters. And this is important because, as you'll see, once we actually reconstruct both the random field and this level set re, um, threshold in truth, that we start to learn the hyperparameters both through the level set reconstruction, but also um, the original material that we've done. So this is the truth that we're going to use for the EIT problem. We're interested in reconstructing this truth. So I've done this for three cases, one which is the non-hierarchical case, and the other two which is to consider these two cases right here as well. So let's take the case of the non-hierarchical one. So at the very top row that you see and at the very first column that you get, this is the initial ensemble that you have for the first experiment, and then iteratively we've done this until the very last iteration on the right-hand side. So these are the Gaussian random fields that you see at the very top, and at the very bottom, what you see is just the level set threshold in that you have through the length scale and the regularity. So these thresholds really show you a good correspondence, not of the actual simple level set function, but the Bayesian level set function, which takes the hyperparameters into consideration. So as we progress exactly along the iteration, it really struggles to actually learn the underlying unknown because we've set a high regularity and we've set a high length scale for this as well. Yep. So, so the iteration is just using the ENKF to actually reconstruct pointwise measurements of this actual image right here. So we've taken measurements within this image and we're just using those measurements in the actual algorithm to, to recover this. So what's iterating here? What's the it, what is iterating is just your initial ensemble given by this. This is iterating. So this is using measurements of this image right here to try and reconstruct this. So you have a bunch of ensembles from your prior? Which is just given by this here. Mm -hmm. First column? Uh, first column, first row, yeah. And then what's the last column? The last column is just, uh, the, is just the very last iterate through the... Uh, so you repeat this? You repeat this, yeah. Okay. You repeat it, yeah. So the random fields are given on the first row, and the second row is given by, of course, the level set threshold. In. So just the take-home message is that because the regularity and the length scale are different to the truth and the initial ensemble, it's really struggling, as you can see here, to learn this overall unknown. Now let's go to the first hierarchical case, the centered case. Again, the initial ensemble is very different to the truth, which you can see through the hyperparameters, but really, overall, it's really starting to really find it quite difficult to actually learn this unknown. As you can see, it is starting to learn the two blobs from the level set formulation, but because the regularity and the length scale are not really learned quite effectively, it's not really doing a good job whatsoever. It's starting to learn in the right ideas, but really, it's only learning the overall unknown, but not the additional parameters theta. Okay, and this is what we expected with the centered case because you do have this dependence of the actual hyperparameters as well. And then finally, if you consider the non-centered case where we have an initial ensemble which is different with regularity and different with length scale, then as you progress throughout the iteration, you not only start to see an increase in the learning of the underlying unknown, which is the truth, but this image gives, well, this top row image, I think, gives a very nice understanding that you're actually learning both the regularity and the length scale as well. 
So this matches the initial understanding that we had that if you did take a non-centered approach through the ideas behind Roberts and Skuld, then actually through the reparameterization, you can learn both the unknown, which is given by this, but also the true regularity and the true length scale as well. And just to point out that this is very much possible just because of the level set threshold in. Uh, we, we've, we've got no uh, theoretical, um, we've got no theoretical theorems to show that it does converge, but at least numerically we see that it starts to work. So and theoretically, it converge, yeah, also, yeah, but yeah, for the overall, for, for the overall unknown, yeah, but nothing in terms of theory. We've got nothing in terms of that. Okay, so non-centered works the best compared to the other two methods. So just to give you one slide just of improvements that we can make to the actual hierarchical learning. Um, I didn't mention this, but at, in this actual image right here, what we usually assume is that your hyperparameters, which are defined, are usually governed, let's say theta, is usually governed through a uniform distribution where we have, let's say, a lower bound A and we have an upper bound B. Okay, so these are scalar. All of, the, all of these hyperparameters that we define are scalar, including the regularity and the length scale. And one interesting direction that we thought we would consider for this work is to say that, well, rather than actually considering these hyperparameters as scalar fields, why don't we just do something similar to the overall, overall unknown, which is to consider them as random fields as well. And if we consider the hyperparameters as random fields, then maybe that can improve the overall underlying uh, maybe that can improve the overall inversion that we're trying to do as well. So as I've stated on this slide, uh, what we've considered is the exact same stochastic partial differential equation that we had to generate the random uh, fields, but instead these length scales that you see right here, which are incorporated, are actually random fields as well, not scalar fields as well. Uh, and the motivation we had for, for this sort of ideas were also if we were interested in reconstructing images which look like this where you had some smooth bit right here, which could easily be approximated through a Gaussian. But of course, in terms of this image right here, it would be very difficult to actually reconstruct this through a Gaussian as well. You would need some form of L1 regularization or other forms of regularization as well. So I'm not, because of time constraints and other things that I want to discuss, I actually haven't put the results of these in this actual slide, but everything, uh, all of these ideas which I've mentioned here are discussed in this paper right here. And I just want to point out that in order to incorporate both these sort of Gaussian bell shapes, but also these uh, boxcar plots, we've considered two random fields. We've considered a Gaussian random field, but also we've considered a Cauchy random field as well. Okay, so I'm going to discuss a little bit more about the theoretical understanding of Cauchy random fields in inverse problems next week, but this paper just highlights any of the, the future experiments uh, regarding reconstructing unknowns which look like this. Okay. So in terms of the analysis, as I've said, there's a very limited amount of analysis which is done for both ENKF and EKI. But what has been done so far is actually to consider continuum limits. Now, even though that we discretize everything in terms of the numerics, one would, one would ask, why are we interested in continuous time limits? Well, understand the dyna understanding the dynamics of how the ensemble works through the ENKF uh, can really be verified through continuous time limits. And this has been done through the ENKF. And what we've tried to do this is also apply this in the terms of the inverse problem setting. So let's take our usual update equation that we have in the non-hierarchical case, which is just given by this top equation right here. And of course, we introduce some time step in, which is given by H, which we assume to be 1 over n. And usually what you would do in the continuous time limit is that you would be interested in taking this particular quantity towards zero, okay? And if we consider this particular quantity towards zero, and if we consider the hierarchical case for inverse problems, then what we actually end up, is, end up with is this Ito stochastic differential equation, which is given in this form right here. So initially we had u for the non-hierarchical case, but here we've considered the non-centered, which is why we're interested in psi instead of u. And this is the Edo stochastic differential equation, which is done, which is actually discretized using an Euler-Mariama way. Okay, and a lot of the theory which has been designed so far has taken quite a simplistic approach for continuous time limits. And what I mean by that is that we've mainly assumed that we've dealt with uh, a noise-free case, so we move these actually perturbed observations, which are given right here. But as well as this in the continuous time limit, we assume that we have this linear structure, which is given right here, which makes the analysis a little bit easier when we're trying to derive the continuous time limit. And once we can take the continuous time limit for inverse problems in the hierarchical case, then it looks almost identical to the ENKF and also the non-hierarchical case, where we get this ordinary differential equation. I mean, if you, if you take the, the noise-free linear case, you remove this dependence of the noise, 
You turn this SDE into an ODE, and what you do is you can write the particular form of the ODE in this right here, which is a preconditioned gradient flow structure right here, where this covariance is just given by this, and this structure right here is just given by your misfit functional as well. And with this additional continuous time limit, we have a theorem which states that if you have this particular psi through the non-centered approach, and if you have the hyperparameters which define it, then if you actually project this into your linear subspace, if you try to project this into your linear subspace, then this actually does not abide by the linear um, subspace property. So psi and the hyperparameters don't actually stay within the linear span of the initial ensemble. And again, this is what we assumed, considering the numerics actually learned the hyperparameters quite nicely. So this theorem just, states, just sort of gives the evidence towards the numerics that we've done. But there's still, of course, limitations within this idea in that if you are trying to reconstruct, let's say, this particular image right here, let's say you've got your method which starts to find the truth. There is no exact guarantee that it will stay within it and how long it can stay within it as well. So what we've motiv motivated really from hierarchical inversion is to see whether actually we can apply box constraint optimization to these techniques. Hierarchical inverse problems, I told you that the hyperparameters are actually given by uniform distribution. In other words, a box, let's say, with a lower bound A and B. So what we're trying to do with this work is trying to make sure that it actually stays within this box because there is no guarantee that it will stay within this box. Okay? And what we've motivated for this is to use box constraint optimization in order to do this right here. So we're going to take a very basic box. We're going to take an n-dimensional box, which is given by A of 1, B1, times all the way up to A and B n, where n is the dimension. And from this box constraint, idea, we're interested in the particular box constraint projection, which projects the actual ensemble of particles from Rn, which you can assume to be x, to the actual box, which is just given by A of B, let's say, in the one-dimensional case right here. And this particular projection is just given as this right here. And just to give an actual visual representation of what we mean by this projection, it's given in this image right here. Okay. So we're interested in box constraint optimization, and we're interested in some analysis of this. So like I'd done on a few previous slides, we're also interested in a continuous time limit of this particular case. So this is the update equation that you would usually have with your E and KF, but there is a slight difference here where you include this bit, and the difference of this is because we have considered an ensemble square root filter, not a root filter. <laughs> so we've even considered an ensemble square root filter, which is just a deterministic case of the E and KF, okay? So very similar update equation, works very similarly, just you have a few additional terms, and it's deterministic because you remove these perturbed observations in the square root filter. So once you have this update equation in the ensemble square root filter with this step size, and of course you define the projected ensemble given by this right here, then very similarly you can write an actual continuous time limit uh, through its just general, for what you can do is you can write the continuous time limit just using the basic definition of derivatives given as this right here. And with this particular form, you can also write it in terms of directional derivatives, which, which helps analysis that I haven't discussed right here, but you can write this in terms of directional derivatives right here. And this continuous time, time limit uh, also has a gradient flow structure similar to that of what was shown before. So, Using this analysis and what was shown before, the idea is that if you have this box constraint optimization, then what these ideas at the end are very saying is that if you have this box and if you have your trajectory which is going towards B, then what we're trying to do is trying to project it downwards again. And then if you have the projection which is going towards A, then you project it back up. So in other words, because of these two ideas that we have for the box constraint optimization, this is ensuring that it actually stays within a particular box, which, let's say, is a particular subspace or subspace of the actual truth, underlying truth as well. So I'm just going to give you one basic numerical example because this still is very much work in progress. There's a lot of subfigures. Uh, you can ignore most of them apart from just the very top left one. And I don't know how clearly you can see this, but the green bit even I'm a bit confused myself. So the green bit corresponds to the actual truth of this image, and what you have for the ensemble square root filter without the projection are these blue lines right here. So as you can see, it is starting to get the right shape, but there is a lot of fluctuations that you have right here, and maybe not so clearly what you have as well is the box constraint ensemble square root filter, which is this orange line right here. And as you can see, that it's really starting to be more restrictive compared to this ensemble square root filter, and really it's got two bounds which you have, given this here, and just given is here, right here. So in practice, at least for 1D in basic cases, the projection based optimization does work for these methods. This is just for the ensemble square root filter. You can also apply this for the ENKF, 
but the motivation behind doing this was actually to ensure that these hyperparameters stayed within these uniform constraints. So that obviously is the next natural thing that we're looking to do within this work. And finally, just a little bit about the actual more recent ideas that we're having, which is based on optimal transport. So optimal transport ideas have been quite frequently used in a number of different fields. We've seen a lot of talks this past few weeks based on using optimal transport for MCMC. They've also been used in ideas for, um, let's say, partial differential equations. And more recently, a very keen interest, uh, a f field which has taken keen interest in optimal transport is data simulation. Okay? And really the ideas of first using optimal transport for data simulation go back to Sebastian Reich, whose talk was very similar um, to these few slides right here. And the idea that Sebastian had of using optimal transport techniques within um, these sort of um, data simulation problems is that usually you would have an update equation as uh, we have here in the ensemble square root filter, but also the ensemble Kalman filter. But what the idea is behind optimal transport instead is to actually, let's say that we have a prior distribution of your initial ensemble. And let's say that you have a posterior distribution in a naive way given by nu, which represents your updated ensemble of particles, then would there be an easier and more systematic way to actually couple or see the differences or really pr ways to project the ideas from the prior to the posterior in data simulation? And one way to do this through optimal transport is just to really look at the Kantorovich problem, which is really looking at this minimizing the expectation of this particular cost function right here where these are particular marginals, and gamma refers to the actual couplings that you have between the probabilistic distributions, so of the, of the distributions. So again, here, mu represents your prior, and mu, which you have right here, is the posterior. And what we're interested in, uh, in understanding from, up, uh, from using optimal transport ideas to data simulation, is to just use the analysis that we've done for continuous time limits, and actually see if we can use these ideas to formulate the gradient flow structure as we did in the non-optimal transport framework. So that's what we're interested in. And uh, there's a number of ways that you can do this. Gradi Wasserstein gradient flow problems are of quite of interest. And usually, they can be approached using these ideas of entropic regularization. So the Kantorovich problem is looking to sort of minimize this idea or trying to find, uh, to, to, to minimize this cost functional where you've got a number of different couplings. But of course, this problem can be quite expensive and uh, it can be quite uh, unsmooth in the sense that your solution is not so smooth. So one way to overcome this is just to use entropic regularization, which has been quite successful. So as before, this would be your Wasserstein problem or your optimal transport problem where this is your Wasserstein distance. And if you consider an entropic regularization idea, you're just adding some regularization term at the very end, which let's say f of u is entropy, and this is just some particular time step. And the PDE community has seen particular interest in this because if you take this particular method of entropic regularization, and if you take the time step of this towards zero, then what you get in the actual limit itself is a sort of Fokker-Planck equation or some partial differential equation, which is a very similar form to the Fokker-Planck equation. We're not interested in that because um, because it's already been looked at, but what we are interested in is understanding the gradient flow in a, in a little bit of a different way. And um, how we consider this is to consider our actual uh, discrete distributions, mu of t and mu of t, as just empirical discrete measures given by this. Uh, and if you consider this in, in anthropic regularization, this is just given or known as the Lagrangian discretization. You can also consider an Eulerian discretization as well. But the reason we're considering this form of discretization is because we're not only interested in these measures, we're also interested in the actual locations and how they progress through time, which of course sounds interesting if you're interested in the ensemble common filter as well. Five minutes, okay, thank you. I'm almost finished anyway. So what we're interested in is writing or a way of representing the actual system of uh, the ensemble Kalman filter as really a system of n-coupled ordinary differential equations. And even though we haven't shown the analysis right, right uh, we haven't, even though this is very recent, we haven't shown the analysis, what we are hoping in mind is that we should get something of this right here. So let's say right here that these are the actual um, measures right here, which are just given by th this set of collection of particles. Then if you have this collection of particles, which is evaluated in this F, which is just the actual empirical uh, measure evaluated in this particular functional form right here, then hopefully what we should get is a set of n-coupled ordinary differential equations which have this particular form right here. And this is one thing that we're aiming to do at the minute. But what we've done in the meantime, uh, as well as looking at the actual um, way of representing this, is trying to come up with looking this in a numerical way. And uh, just to show you of how this works, um, 
just a sort of teaser that this isn't working quite well. We don't know if this is to do with the dynamics, but most likely the code. So what we've considered is a Gaussian mixture model where we have a prior and we've got a posterior. And we're, all we're interested in is actually seeing this gradient flow structure as time progresses. Okay? So if I click play and we see the gradient flow structure, we get this really horrible structure which we don't know why isn't working. We think it may be to do with the dynamics, which really doesn't make sense because you have these tree, these sort of looking tree objects and these branches, which makes no sense whatsoever, or it could just most likely be in terms of the numerics. But what we should get in the gradient flow structure is something which kind of looks like a stationary Gaussian um, distribution itself. But of course, this gradient flow structure is wrong. I don't think the dynamics have anything to do with this, most likely the numerics, and we're still trying to verify this with the actual scale and limit in, in the gradient flow as well. Yep, and, and, and that slide was, this, was, was supposed to have the actual uh, simulation, but it doesn't. So just to conclude the presentation, um, my work has been looking at the Ensemble Kalman filter, which so far has showcased itself to be a very simple, powerful tool, and a very applicable one as well. And what I was interested in throughout this presentation was just to give you some ideas of how you can use the ENKF in different fields, such as Bayesian inverse problems, but also optimal transport as well. And I think because of the relationships that you can have, especially between inverse problems and data simulation, it makes for a very nice relationship between these two fields as well. And in particular, what I was interested in doing for inverse problems was to consider hierarchical cases, which really moved away from this limitation of the subspace property, but as well as this to consider further improvements to this, such as box constraint optimization, but also further hierarchical techniques where we consider other random fields and we consider non-stationary random fields as well. Okay. And in terms of further work that we're trying to do at the minute, uh, as I mentioned, for the projection-based optimization, the initial intention was to use this for hierarchical ensemble common inversion. This hasn't been done yet. We've just considered this for the non-hierarchical case. This, of course, is quite obvious to do just for the next step. And then the final bit that we're looking at to improve on this is actually to consider different forms of regularization within the ensemble common filter. So there is a relationship that you can make between Tikhonov regularization and Bayesian inverse problems. And this is usually inclusive with the MAP estimate where you've got some incorporation and inclusion of camera Martin spaces. Um, again, this is um, just very new recent work, but we think that if you incorporate these forms of regularization, which fit very nicely within this framework, then you can, of course, improve your method and you can get some nice, um, nice theory as well. And of course, just with these methods, because it is a black box, and because these scale very well compared to MCMC methods and other Monte Carlo methods as well, uh, it's very obvious, I think, to apply these to many large-scale, high-dimensional problems which are used in practice. So this concludes my talk for today, and he's, here are a number of useful references which are just based on my presentation, so thanks. Mm -hmm. is, is the method constrained to that, or is it just more it's, it, it's not constrained to that. The, I, I mean, um, you, can, you can use whatever covariance uh, family uh, you want to be honest, but the reason we chose Matern was because other covariance families that you use, uh, they can be considered a special case of the Matern covariance family. But as well as this, if you do compare those other families, um, the Matern covariance not only includes the length scale and the amplitude, which is common, it also includes this regularity, which is not common within other families as well. So we were interested in this because we could learn other hyperparameters which weren't which we're missing. So that's why we use the Whittle Matern. But it's not specific to that. You can use other covariance functions, such as squared exponential or even exponential. So uh, yeah, you're right, I, I uh, didn't mention any update equations for the hyperparameters, but uh, if you did want to write the update equations for the hyperparameters, you could, they can be written in almost very similar way to just the, the, the first update equation that I gave you. Okay, and you actually literally iterate this a few times. Uh, uh, well, yeah. I don't see why that would give you the base, you know, anything close to the base solution, right? Because you're getting more and more of the light solution. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an approximation of the solution. Um, it's, uh, let's say it's not as accurate compared to MCMC methods, I can definitely say that, but uh, at least it's got the main advantage while still retaining a good level of accuracy of being much more efficient and 
being a lot more costly. So that's the main thing to take away really from this, is that you can get a good level of accuracy and it's significantly cheaper. And because the ENKF, which is, which is originally designed for Gaussian uh, initial ensembles, because we're using Gaussians here for the EKI as well, it, it works quite well. If you use other initial ensembles, such as from a uniform distribution or other distributions, it won't work as well. So, so that's probably one reason why it, it works well. In some cases, we've seen a collapse. It's not so obvious what happens, though. Uh, but very, very, rare, very, in, in very rare conditions, it will collapse. Okay. It just depends on, the, on how you uh, adapt so the you parameters. Would you guess it's over the out from your converged uh, ensemble We haven't looked. Really it's a little bit difficult to interpret in this setting, yeah. It would be of interest, but I think it's quite difficult.